Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the 2030.cloud DevOps lunch conversation from December 22nd was amazing. We started with the SolarWinds hack and then moved into all of the ways in which our industry actually makes those hacks likely and very hard to avoid. We discuss government and economics. We talk about privacy and security and how all of those things interplay to impact our industry. And that is exactly the type of discussions we've been having all year long with the 2030.cloud. You are invited to participate in any of our weekly sessions. And of course, in our January 7th larger format session, where we're gonna be going from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon Pacific, uh, and actually working on what it's gonna look like all together. Please come, the2030.cloud. And thank you. Enjoy the conversation. So my question is, what's the odds on favorite that solo wins will survive? I have answers, in my opinion. I'm curious. I'm happy to go first. Um, you know, public memory is so short. Yeah. Um, it's so short. I, you I know, it's, it's going to be hard to get off that plat that platform. And it, it's actually not a bad platform for all their the mistake they made. But what's your what's your take? I thought that they were gonna make it until I keep hearing the rollout of the numbers, right? It's mm. like it's one thing if you have you know government, whatever, that's that's their sloppiness or whatever, but I'm hearing, you know, forty it's this it's this it's the forty percent of customers from you know Microsoft that are affected. It's it's the subplot. It's the, mm -hmm. it keeps rolling down and down and down. And it's like, I think we'll be, I think it's going to take us 18 months to two years to figure out really what the full impact is. And I think you're going to see a situation where wait until the lawyers get into this, the class action lawsuits alone. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where I think you're the, the harm. This is there's, there's real harm. Yeah. Actually, that's, I think that's, that would be the, the breaking point. It, it's right now, there's a lot of hand wringing and, you know, real inf infiltration, but we haven't, we haven't seen the harm. If there's harm, provable harm. Yeah. Yeah, the insurance is going to be worthless. I, my question Which is, is sort of oh, like, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's, sorry, it's sort of like, um, I'm going to use a horrible analogy, but it's like people with sexually transmitted diseases. They, a whole group of people might have them, but nobody wants to talk about it. So it's possible that solar wind skates because nobody wants to talk about having been hacked. Is that like the uh, AWS breach that the girl from San Francisco did, where it's like in the industry, everybody knew it was something that was always there, right? This and was the, so, S, the S3 compromise. Yeah, right? and, yeah, and so no one wanted to talk about it because how vulnerable everybody was. It was like everyone just said, shh, 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 shh just fix it, fix it, fix it, right? I, the problem here is that people are going to brag about the crap. They're going to brag about this one. I, I wonder, mm. are we getting to a place in the U.S. specifically where there's going to be this demand that cybersecurity at a higher level is the edict of the government or some government agency. Ooh. And that what we're going to see is either harder standards or and or the co corporations are going to say, federal government, you need to put up a firewall to protect us from government, government, because this is a you know it's one thing, some kid sitting in a bed, sitting in the basement, or a group of people <laughs> back, the classic uh, basement or, on your on your on your bed, yeah, that's yeah. It. But when you have government actors, China, North Korea, Russia, these are these are these are basically military type. You know, they're wearing a uniform. They're not even wearing a uniform, but they're in essence they are uniform actors right so they are yeah, that's right it is uh, uh iran you know these are government folks who are you would almost say they're part of a of a, of a sort of military division mm -hmm. um 
I don't know. No company can compete. Can 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 do something against that. that that's that's different. That's a whole nother level. I no. I, I and this is where one one of one of the things that that I think about in these cases is the anonymity of the of the internet, right? It's sort of a design feature, mm. but. There, you know, there's more and more places where it shows up like a bug, hmm. um, right? With misinformation, with trolling, with um, you know, abuse of social social networks, uh, false claims. Um, yeah. And so, right? If 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 it's possible that we'd have a convergence between this this problem of um, attacks and then also the you know, if we actually start cracking down on social media and monetization of data, of personal data, mm. I, I could see um, anonymity going, I, I'm not, actually, I'm a fan of anonymity going away on the internet, although my friends point out that it's actually really useful and that we shouldn't get rid of it. Um, well, I think we got too much of that crap. I mean, honestly, excuse me, it is the, the ability to hide and not be held accountable for what we say and how we act. Um, <laughs> that it is, it, 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 it's, it's taken a beautiful thing called technology and turned it into the things of movies, right? These are, these are class B movies. I mean, you know, A movies or B movies, they're class C or D movies. You know, the scripts would have been laughed out of Hollywood. Someone wrote it on, you know, on a bender. And, but we're starting to see that reality, right? But the pro problem is, is who gets to hold who accountable? I mean, what's the problem here? <sighs> what about people that are protesting for democracy in Hong Kong? You, you know, I, 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 wasn't a, I wasn't a fan of Madison, but 2020 has made me a greater fan of Madison and not of Jefferson. <laughs> you want to you want to expand on the, your Federalist uh, <laughs> reference? <sighs> Madison said something. He said Americans. He said he said he said the citizens of America are not smart enough to pick their own electors. Right. Yeah, that's right. I have. I was just informed that a niece I love dearly serves in the military said something very interesting said she, she said to her mother um at least we got a raise under trump we didn't get anything under obama and i said to her mother i said does she remember sequester does she remember that the whole entire time that the 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 the, 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 the pentagon was under sequester so there was no money and you go back to That's your point funny. about the memories are, are short and i'm now believing that what 2020 has exposed more than anything, is the dearth of edu our education system sucks, or the fact that the lack of, of, of attentiveness to something outside of their own sphere of concern. We have, until we get a society that's more concerned about my brother as opposed to my new TV or my, you know, whatever my thing is, me, 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 and starts thinking about the other. I don't, I, th 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 Derek, to answer your question, I don't know who can be the arbiter of, of, of what is good or bad, but we need something because leaving it to human nature is just sucks. We've, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is have to be careful leaving it to governments because. Oh, I agree. Who hey, look. say that the, a given government. Is Oops. You just Derek, you just muted yourself. Yeah. Mid sentence. 1984 is not lost on me. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it's interesting. We haven't really had a Section 230 conversation uh, yet, um, meaning the the section that allows mm -hmm. internet providers to not be responsible for the content mm -hmm. that they promote. Um, I've had some really interesting talks with people about about the pros and cons with that and it's it's not so simple but it it does strike me as 
um, what you were what you were saying, I come back to you. Pe individual people have to be accountable for their actions. On mm -hmm. you know, they're they're accountable in person, and so it, we the internet has gotten to a point um, where it's not there is no distinction between what happens online and what happens in real life. That's we 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 left that in the dust, especially this year. Mm. So the idea that you would have, you know, two ver two sets of rules, um, strikes me as problematic. Like just like we, you know, two sets we we got rid of two sets of taxation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but there was there was a really good and and for everybody we're gonna have um, in two in two weeks on the seventh we're gonna have a. a longer form discussion on the cloud 2030 stuff. Um, I was just working on the agendas and I'll post that out. Um, I have a general general request, even if you can't come, please help us amplify the discussion. Um, and we're gonna be talking about this intersection of economics and governance and technology mm -hmm. and data mm -hmm. um, in, in, in respect to how it's gonna shape our future for the next 10 years, so. Um, I, so I, I'm looking, I'm looking, forward, to I'm looking yeah. forward to that. I, I guess the question I want to ask going into that is who yeah. do you, and this is really what Derek was getting at, who do you believe the invisible hand is? And so I mm. think you start from that premise. Like are that. we truly a free market society? Or are we a market of whether it's government um, uh, monopoly? or private sector monopoly, have we fooled ourselves into thinking that we truly are an open market and that regulation <laughs> actually could be a way to keep it open as opposed to what we think we have, which is free market, which is controlled by the four, you know, the, 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 the four top technology firms in the, in the world, right? I mean, the question is, are we truly free or, are, or do we think we are? Right. Just a thought. No, I, I, you're asking the, there's a huge question of who's, who's controlling the levers, right? To me, um, when the GDP of Amazon is more than, you know, most countries, um, you know, when does it become a governmental entity? When does the government decide that it's, you know, going to be threatened by it? Hmm. Um, legitimately threatened by it, not personality feuds. Yeah. By it. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, we're, I, I, I don't know what gets people to ask, ask these questions in a meaningful way, except, you know. I think it's worthwhile. I think right. it's worthwhile looking back about a, a little over a century where you had basically cartels truly giant companies that were so egregious in their, basically their suppression of competition, their, um, you know, their basic, you know, pure greed, you know, the greed is good theme, that what, what actually happened was a, you know, a, a progressive movement that basically brought in regulation. It wasn't regulation first in order to make things or keep things on an even keel. It was regulation to basically bust up the trusts of the late 19th century. And then once again, regulation and the formation of administrative governmental bodies like the SEC, like the FDA in the 20s and 30s that were brought in to, or that were established in order to protect the population from basically, you know, complete laissez-faire marketing, market capitalism. The yeah. interesting thing is that the people that were brought in to actually do those things and set them up were some of the most notorious offenders from the past generations. 
And I'm thinking of the SEC basically being defined and the rules of the SEC being heavily, heavily um, basically put in place by one of the biggest um, offenders, and that was Joseph P. Kennedy. So, so basically, Richard's saying that we keep reliving the standard oil Ma Bell situation. Well, we're 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 reliving the Andrew Car Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller. We're right. reliving the uh, the IBM, the, the AT and T Ma Bell, uh, the Microsoft, and yes, you're you know you're right. We are reliving it. So what it says is. To me, and, and I would say that regulation has been put in place, some of which I would have to say on, you know, on a, on a historical accounting has saved a lot of lives and, and has been successful in many ways of putting a number of these unfettered giants, uh, at least in their place, mm -hmm. think we're possibly at a point where it's going to happen again. Um, so now the question is, what are some of the parts that worked? And what are some of the parts that of regulation that clearly did not? And this kind of gets back not so much to anonymity, but to transparency. Probably one of the biggest ways in which you prevent and stop a lot of this is by forcing the open, well, <clears throat> the illumination of what's going on, the inability for many of these, these organizations to hide what they're doing behind, you know, you know, loopholes in the law and reporting and so forth. If in fact, um, you know, go, go to the, uh, <laughs> to the, the fairly recent law allowing uh, corporations to, or organizations to uh, make un, unfettered <laughs> uh, contributions to political causes and hide behind a pack where you, you don't know whose money it is or what what's behind it. This is a place where if all the donors had to be recognized in the open, who was supporting what cause, there would be a little different set of behaviors. So I'm- I agree with you on that. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, um, I have to take a deep breath waiting for what's going to happen this coming year, two years in this regard. And 230 is going to be square in it. And there are going to be a lot of other parts of it. But if it isn't done now, it's going to be a real hard thing for us to live with. Uh, it's going to be a hard thing for me to live with uh, just in terms of my conscience. Yeah, right. I mean, I deal with my wife all the time who says, I talk about some of the things we talk about in 2030. I talk about some of the things that my team did when I was leading the innovation team at, uh, at Verizon Connect and, you know, autonomous vehicles and using cameras to predict or the cameras to tell what's a safe route home from a university, right? So you use a camera that can identify, you know, safe by population and says, oh, there's a group of people here. You, you should be safer here than being on a dark street that's not a lot. And she goes, well, what about the privacy? What about, what about, you know, she's always concerned about yeah. you know, the, the helicopter and I get it. And as Richard, to your point about conscience, I mean, as a business person like you, you know, we, we kind of have, we live in two worlds, right? We look at ways in how to extract revenue from this technology, these technologies that advance and push the envelope. I think Rob mentioned one time we were having a conversation, I don't know if it was this or 2030, we were talking about safer cars, right? Having safer vehicles. What does that mean from a privacy perspective, right? And how do you exploit that 
to maximize revenue, but then are you pushing us further, further, further down the road of, you know, where, you know, where our lives are going to be taken over by this technology and we, we no longer have control over our own destinies? I don't know. It's, it's well, there's, you know, there are wonderful things that have been, you know, that we're now in, whether we enjoy them or not, we're certainly been made our lives have been made better by them, but mm -hmm. they don't they don't come for free, and um, and when I say they don't come for free, the cost is one of oversight and taking you know paying attention. And you were talking about uh, the education system, you know, a little bit earlier, Keith. I I just leave, I put it down to it's not even so much education as it is some of the most basic civics, you know, how does, how does the government work? How does this government supposedly work? What are the rules? If that were uh, a little bit better understood, uh, for example, judges don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to, you know, change the course of the, of, of government and the law. No, they, they don't. They're, they're not allowed to. And if they try, they should be, you know, brought up for, brought up on charges. So I mean, there's there's a lot to be done, okay. uh, but a, a great deal of it has to be civics and just pretty, pretty, awareness. Pretty, pretty sure that last one's a debate on the uh, Supreme Court, though, right? Oh boy, <laughs> there it is. It, it is. It, it is. And I, yeah, that was that was kind of heartbreaking watching that whole process. Yeah, so Rob, Rob put the thing in there and in, 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 I joined late, so I, I, I for a couple minutes. Um, it's interesting that the Unicorn um, Project book and this topic are actually kind of related, right? And <clears throat> explain what I mean is, um, yeah, I've, I've used these numbers before. It's like, you know, half of the S&P 500 is going to be replaced in the next five years. 84% of all these modernization projects fail. Oh, <clears throat> so if you don't address, if you can't solve that problem, which isn't fixing educational systems because it's all happening now, right? right. You, you're going to be not left with nothing but Google and Facebook and these other companies because they're the ones that are basically accelerating their curve right now. Yeah. If we don't fix this in the next five years, there's really not going to be anything left to fix. Exactly right. Yep. There is, we don't have the luxury of a, of a, of a long lead time. I, you know, it's well, funny because we, we portray a lot of the technologies and pieces that are as, as absolutely essential. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, there was, a, I, and I, I posted this in the 2030 thing that, that um, on the media post about um, uh, Facebook and Google and social and the, the commoditization of human futures is the way they described it. It's, it's pertinent, but I, I don't want to dive down too deeply. But at some point, we're still, you know, the world is actually should be should be more dominated by, you know, production of food and, and housing and, you know, education oh. and healthcare and stuff like that. I, it's, how does how does how did Facebook and Google get to be the essential technology here? Right. I mean, the, the it, you know, it, it, about, way, about about had we, had we right? not had we not had them and the infrastructure on which they depended, had we just gone through what we've done for the last year, had had COVID happened. 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, I venture to guess that many parts of the systems that we're now kind of happily taking for granted would have failed, and some of them would fail, would have failed pretty miserably, and we would be in a much bigger world of hurt, more immediate world of hurt than we are already. So, I, it, and to your point about food, housing, yeah. take, I take that as, you know, absolutely true. And at the same time, in the course of our lifetimes, the production of food, the reduction in official definition of what 
poverty level is, you know, exists in the world has gone down by, you know, it's, um, uh, it is absolutely amazing what has, what has happened economically and in just in terms of quality of life for a lot of reasons. Again, it's perspective, it's information, it's understanding of what's going on, but I don't, yeah. like, I guess what I said is, you know, there are trade-offs, there's a certain kind of amount of budget that we have to, for attention, and there's a budget that we have for where we put our resources, and so, yep. that's what I would leave it with. So, Google, Facebook, they're the new opiates of the masses. <laughs> and how? They, I mean, religion <laughs> used to be there, and religion was there to quiet the masses from protesting their, their horrendous conditions. And Google and Facebook are providing that now. So that's why they're so important. They're, they're keeping those, those kids that should be getting education but aren't uh, quiet and, uh, and on, on the, the track wanted. Rocky, do you think that it's, it's actually the, was it a conscious decision? You talk about the kind of the opiate of the masses and religion. Do you think it was conscious on somebody's part to make that the case for religion yeah. or, or was it more kind of a... Hmm. It, it's sort of, yeah, somebody came out and said, wow, I've got this great candy, but they never think that candy is going to become addictive. Right. Uh, you know, Google was search. Facebook was certainly candy because it's like, how do I keep in touch with my friends? But once, once the connection was made that it was addictive and that uh, if we traded these folks their addiction for their information, we could make lots of money. Um, I, I really think that Zuckerberg caught onto it before Google caught onto it. But, it, but is, is there yeah. a historical parallel for the type of free service that, that we are in the middle of economically, right? I mean, I... I well, it's religion, it's... except religion, they, they ask you to donate, so they pass the plate. Well, you know, I, I really don't think it's, it's religion. No. It's, it's, I, I, it's I, I, really, I agree with John. Well, yeah, it's not religion, and this this is this is the reverse of religion. Religion, well, it's capitalism. The replacement of religion, though. No, no, it's really not it right. Is. And I'll go back and say you could blame blame Pong, right? <laughs> there, there are. I mean, think think about what created the generation that is is predominantly driving these tools forward, right? You know, the addiction created with, you know, Pong and Atari and games. And, and now, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have gamers. <laughs> now, now uh, it, okay. Keep going. Well, 20 years. We're not, not the same math in that, right? So there are certain things that happened. Not as an esports. Okay. Right. And, and um, you know, really what you've seen is, you know, so Zuckerberg basically institutionalized um, um, gossip. Right. And then what drove that once you started building up these networks, right, is how do I monetize that? And so most of the growth off of Google or most of the growth off of Facebook really was driven by not that I've got these. It's a whole network effect. Seventy percent of all value drives off of these network effects. And so I've just created new ways of monetizing it. Um, I, I think when you associate it with religion, right, it has some underlining motivation they were trying to do. What I really think it is. How do I extract every penny out of the eyeballs I've captured? Yes. Yeah, from their perspective, it's not captured. religion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, when you when you say, John, when you say extract, mm -hmm. there's a question of whether you're basically milking or extracting from that consumer or using them as fodder, as feed stock in order to, 
take money off of advertisers, variety of other just as, in some cases, even more heinous organizations. So it's, it's not simply kind of going after them directly. It is using them in, in some very unusual ways, some of which we haven't seen. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff has this notion of uh, surveillance capitalism, which is a, which is a fascinating book and, and worth, worth checking out. Not, you know, the book itself is very repetitious and a long, and a long, very, very long read, but there are a lot of uh, presentations that she has made and others have made about it. And it's, it's worth taking a look at. Um, and, you know, this is a case of Google first figuring out how to take data exhaust and turning it into something that is very valuable for advertisers. And, yeah, there think, are, you know, people like, um, oh, well, it, the same, the same approach, you know, was, was taken up by Facebook thereafter. So, yeah. So think of it. I guess I'm, I'm thinking out loud a little bit here, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think um, there's a couple of things. So I think one is that they, so there's what a company like Facebook does directly. And then there's the um, ecosystem that they enabled around it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so um, you know, advertising is an interesting example in that. You know, the, the advertising ecosystem, it, it's generally not Google placing the ad, right? It gets a referral, which gets a referral, which gets a referral, which creates a whole bunch of dynamics in the middle, which creates, you know, a whole bunch of fraud in the ad advertising ecosystem. Um, none of that is directly driven by Google. It's just enabled by them. Yeah. Same, same goes for Facebook. But at the same time, it is, you know, 80 something, 90 something percent of their revenue um, from that perspective. I mean, it's, they're giving away a product. They're, they're giving away a service. No, they're selling, they're selling that offering right, right. to people and what they are, what they are giving away free, quote unquote, is, you know, it's basically, it's like saying, here you are, you know, it's like running a dairy farm. Um, I'm, I'm feeding, I'm feeding the cattle and what I'm getting from them is not, I'm not slaughtering them. I'm, I'm using them as a, as the means of production. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, dairy farm just reminds me of really bad smells. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess I grew up, I grew up on the ranch. So, you know, I, I know you get used to it after a few days, after five but minutes. I don't, I don't. I don't know that there's a parallel here, though. Um, I, I think there's always been parallels, right? It, it, it's in almost any business. If you can't, I mean, the fact of the matter is, Google can't directly place all their ads, right? So that creates a, a marketplace for brokers, right? And and once you've created that marketplace for people to broker the ads, you've created an environment where bad actors can play well but at the same time google has a lot of incentive to capture more and more information to improve the quality of the service that they're providing to the advertisers exactly. right it's that's that this is where there's a I mean, in most of the cases that we've we've been in with monopolies and monopolistic behavior the the virtuous cycle um I, I don't, at some point, I think there was a cap on it. I, right? they, they, there was a, a resource constraint. Right now, we're not at the bottom of, of this virtuous cycle because but, the more data they collect, you know, the more they're able to extract value from that. Um, no, no, no. That, that's actually where I think you're, you're, you're really... So, so first off, Google isn't okay. collecting more data to improve their search service. No, no, they're, right. it's their ad service that they're improving. Right. Um, if you want to improve the search, which is driving this stuff, allow deep searches, right? Which is not what they do. And, and so all the time you try to figure out spending the right keywords, right? They could totally improve their service by, by basically improving deep search, 
results and, and a bunch of things you could do to make searching a lot better, right? So, so all the data they're gathering has nothing to do with the primary service. It's to your point. It, it's about how do I generate more advertising potential? And, and I'd point out, you know, when you go to programmatic advertising, which is having details on the person, right? Google really sucks, right? They have, go, go back to your Google Plus profile. They have very little information about you as a person, right? Go to your Facebook profile. They have very deep information on you. Yeah. So Google using the data for, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Well, they're I, I enabling. Don't, I don't trust it's that simple, but yeah. yeah. Among among other things, they're enabling advertisers to drop cookies, keep track, handle, and and basically run their own, in a small way, um, the kind of intelligence about the person on the other side of the keyboard. But in almost order that to, to do exactly the same thing keep track of where they are what they're doing what they're interested in and and feed them feed them customized information as a result where the objective of that information may be keep them on my site uh have them buy more of x what there you know depends on your business model and this is what google has done uh, extremely, extremely well. They've offered it to a large group and created industries around Google that couldn't exist without Google. Facebook, to your point, is you know right in the right in the thick of it, right in the middle of it. Their whole point is, I want people to stay on my platform as long as possible, in part for advertisement, but in part. There are other reasons why people want to have FaceTime with my, my customer base, my user base. And that can be voter suppression, sowing chaos, you know, you name it. Well, and, and, and Google is YouTube also, right? YouTube is yeah, very, exactly. very similar yeah. from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just too close to the, the tech stack on this one. But, but the point of it is when you're doing most of those ad referrals, that information doesn't come with the ad referral. So, so let's assume something mm -hmm. like 70 or 80% of these ads are not placed by Google. The data they're collecting is it, part of that. Mm -hmm. right? So, so it, it, now this gets back to what was the scandal last year, year before, where Facebook was selling off data to political organizations. Right. right? Yeah. The, the data is really a completely separate source of income. I'm not sure that it's really used to drive some of the advertising side. And, and oh, but it is it is absolutely being used to generate major, major source. It is major yeah. source of revenue, right? Yeah, 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 but it's not in the advertising. It's it's a secondary. No. And so my point of it is, I get back to my original assertion, this is really driven by capitalism, right? Yeah, is I'm yes, making money off. Oh. I'm driving data to generate money. Ah, I see. And I'll I find see. it which way I can do that with. I, I see what you're saying. Yes. It, it is. I mean, it, some of the the a, the algorithms are how do I keep somebody on Facebook because I can show them more ads while they're on Facebook? How do I keep people on YouTube so I can show them more ads while they're on YouTube? Um, uh, what what would it look like if this was actually a you know people paid for this? Um, you mean they pay for the ads? What if what if Google for the search. search was a was a paid service or Facebook was a paid service? Um, well, it would it would, make it would be the modern equivalent of LexisNexis. It would be the you know it would be the um, the modern you know descendant of what uh, Lockheed did with Dialog. You if you wanted information, you paid you know there were different ways you do it. You'd either pay by the drink, you'd pay by a subscription. There were other, there were a variety of metrics. You could uh, have, you know, oh. access to a limited data set that you paid for. It would be 
a different kind of business altogether. It, it's fascinating to me because I'm thinking about the analog of broadcast TV. Because we created, right, when, when since, since broadcast media is a limited resource, government was involved and they, they regulated it. And they also created fairness doctrine and, yeah. you know, controls. And then because there was- it was considered a common, it was a, it, you know, this was common carriage. This was, right. this was something that government at the outset decided was a resource that was limited that needed to be a st- needed to have governance on behalf of the public good and <laughs> which that was that was that was bypassed in a way with the internet for some good reasons some bad well and even cable companies right once you started a pay a pay service with limited access government stepped out of out of cable right that's where cnn and fox stepped in yeah so like oh exactly. we're not governed by you know the the fair the the governance policies of uh broadcast exactly two very different tracks right so so one is about the content that can be created right and and yes the the george carlin seven words you can't say on, <laughs> on public tv <laughs> i can go smash a, a watermelon now yeah what was that and yeah one of my favorite shows of all time was western cable which was entertaining because it was a massive event in the day and and whether it was dolly parton or all the people they'd bring to sell the content to those cable networks yeah. Um, you know, that portion was really technology restricted, right? At one point in life, we could get 40 channels. The next point, we get 200. The amount of content we could bring on <clears throat> grew, right? But really, the, the value of that content was, will we, was anyone really willing to pay advertising around that? <laughs> yeah. Because the breakdown was like 2% of, of cable TVs were, were cable, cable TV shows were paid. So you paid for Disney. You paid for HBO. You paid for Netflix. The cable provider had to pay them and negotiate deals with them. That's right. Um, another two percent of that, or whatever it was, was paid for by the content producers, Home Shopping Network. Right? They bought the channel twenty four hours a day, seven days a week to sell their goods into it. But but the other ninety plus percent was all advertiser driven. Right. And, and as the number of channels expanded away, that actually kind of became more economically feasible. And none of this was government regulated was that, um, you know, Scuddy 25, which is the ad marker they insert into the, the programming. Right. Originally, you had to buy a national spot because there was no way to sell regional or localized advertising. Right. So when they put Scuddy 25 in the MPEG 2, it allowed for regional or local advertising, which allowed them to find more ways of monetizing the content across that network right and and what really kind of transitioned from you know the facebook or the youtube or the other pieces to it is the people that couldn't afford to pay the huge i mean what when when i was working with general instruments we had um uh uh, uh who's the godfather right? like james whatever his name was james taylor like literally on stage in our booth right with, with full open bars so if you didn't have access to those cable people you couldn't afford to get in YouTube was the alternative. I could now bring content in for virtually free. And the number of people that could actually create what we call user-generated content exploded. But that's because the barrier to entry was reduced to a critical point where now almost anyone could do it. So YouTube changed the economics of getting your content out there. Yeah. Uh, that was... It's, the, the, it's interesting because in some ways, what we just went through was a breathtakingly fast evolution of content of of you know how we consume media changing you know in the blink of an eye right because you know in the last 50 years we went from you know broadcast only to you know broadcast being almost dead from a media but it, I, it's I don't, evolving, I, it, right? It's, it's evolved, but I, I, I don't. It, it feels different with the the. I don't, I don't know. Maybe maybe it felt as scary when when 
my parents were watching the cable stuff come, but I don't remember them having any angst about it. Well, what, what Maybe they ask? were because they because because they had um, you know channels they didn't want me to watch, but yeah, yeah. I, I would ask that the, the, the statement Richard made right was almost an interesting question to ask. If COVID had happened ten years ago, what would really have happened? Uh, you mean would things have would things have grown gr gr ground to the stop that it did? Right? Would we have lost our supply well, chains? Let, we, let's 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 think about the fact that there would not have been an Amazon or the kind of infrastructure that was in place right that would allow for people to actually shelter in place and be you know reasonably well off and capable of doing it we would not have had the uh net based electronic commerce and electronic banking in anywhere near the shape we have today that allows us to use our credit cards to shop at those places. Um, now, in terms of your, your personal sanity, we would have not had the kind of streaming media we have today that keeps us, you know, pretty well, you know, doped up, if you'll, if you'll pardon the expression, um, you know, keep you know kind of keeps us out of trouble you know gives us the biggest jukebox in the world to to play music uh i would say that there are both you know fundamental aspects of our day-to-day -day life that would not have been easily replaced and would have um we would have had serious supply chain really serious supply chain issues um and the number of people who would have had access to even what was available 10 years ago would by percentage have been very, a lot smaller than it is today. So hmm. I'm, I'm of the opinion that were this to have happened 10 years ago, we would be finding ourselves in a much more serious situation. I'm, I'm... Can I challenge that a little bit, though? Sure. Yeah, please do, because I, I was going to. But jump um, in. I don't know if we would have been. I think we would have been in a better situation. I think That's because okay. we had, which is odd, right? I don't think of myself as being privileged, but I guess I am. If 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 there wasn't I'm first generation college, right? Mm -hmm. But if there wasn't the internet, then you wouldn't have this dichotomy of folks that are going, we got to lock down and it's, you know, we got to lock down, it's important. And people are going, but you are able to earn money, I'm not, right? I think if everyone was out of work, I think you would have saw a, a, a better commitment. Uh -huh. And a coming together, come almost like a World War II type mentality. Let's do okay. it for the country. So you're you're saying you're you're saying that because it was not as drastic and not as threatening, uh, it didn't call for the same kind of commitment. Yeah, um, I think the the key is is the middle class would have been in the same straits as the uh, the frontline workers, the grocery store workers and whatnot, we all would have been much more exposed and we all would have taken a lot more care and like he said, pulled together the, the World War II mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we hit something that's different. The 2008 financial bust mm -hmm. um, was different because it wasn't contagious in the same way. Um, yeah. Oh, it hit an awful lot of people that I know. There are a lot of folks sure. that I know that lost their homes and went bankrupt. No, it, it definitely, it definitely was was a, you know, a calamity that people didn't bring on themselves, 
from yes. that perspective. And, and Some it people was did an, by, by and getting, it was an economic it was a, it was an economic disaster, but the speed with which and the degree to which this was not only an economic disaster but a public health disaster. But, uh, but I think said yeah I think needs to be drawn out. But so I, so I have so I, I there's a part of me that agrees with what you're saying and there's a part of me that, that wants to push back because because you might get. I think <laughs> I, I think that and, and, and it, what's interesting is I think in 10 years we're, it's going to be much harder. So um, we have what's definitely going much, hard, what's going to be much harder Rob? So so in the last 10 years we have moved from a place of technology being a convenience and an enabler to it being a necessity. right There, there are a lot more processes today that rely on the technologies that you're referring to making things easier than there were even 10 years ago. Like it, 10 years ago, companies, if the credit card machines were down, they would have known how to run paper slips and they can't do that anymore, right? Or they would have gone, they, they would have been able to go back to cash pretty pretty easily and they can't, can't do that anymore. Um, and, and I don't think cash or cashless is that material from a virus transmission perspective from, from that that perspective so I, I i don't think that just you know yeah hey i wouldn't have been able to binge on netflix but i would have been able to watch my 40 channels or 200 channels of, of cable tv and check out books from my library and you know i i, I would have i would have been entertained and I, I don't see that as as the level of hardship it's a convenience i, I mean yeah. our food supply chains were not fixed because of our technology, the technology we've added. Um, you know, maybe we wouldn't have all gotten in on sourdough bread together. Um, but I, you could I have gone back to board games, right? But I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, so that, this is where I, we're, we're in this migration. And, and it, to me, global warming, which is where this gets sort of potentially interesting, because there's all this thing about data centers being, you know, you can't have them in global warming, which I think is BS we're talking because we're talking about efficiencies in transforming our society. And so a lot of the things that we wanna see transformed are going to require going deeper down this technological rabbit hole. I, I just don't know that it needs to be free technology that, that we should be paying for. Like how does, who, I, you I do just got all it. my thoughts jumbled together. So I hope it's Yeah. So I mean, look, a couple of things. We you, you pay for PitchBook because it's a quality data source that has um, uh, uh, information you can't get on Google, right? So there still are paid search services and, and they're out yep. there. And Lexus Nexus was thrown out there as one. I, I've, I've on the paid legal for side. newspapers, digital yeah. newspapers, right? Um, <laughs> you know, so you'll pay where you see that. Still freaking have ads in them, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the other side, you know, the, the, the 08 kind of uh, crisis, right, was a combination of two things, right? It was policy, right? They, they changed the lending rules, allowing virtually anyone to go buy a house, whether they had the financial stability to do or not. Mm -hmm. And then who sold all those things? <laughs> it was Wall Street, right, which made huge profits off of that, right? So there was an know, energy I think crisis you, in the middle of that, too, that people forget about. But. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the intersection of policy and capitalism. I think drives a lot of this stuff and there's good policy and bad policy. If you're talking about 2030, right, which is not today's topic, but I mean, if you think about it, you know, what kind of policies would you like to see in place to prevent some of the things we've seen in the past? No, this is. Right, that, those, that is absolutely the right question, John. I, and, th and this to me is, is the full circle because right, the solar winds breach is actually 100% related to everything we've just been talking about in the and, way and we've we've put the things together the way we allow inner things to be interconnected and and you know can control stuff but i'll bet you money at the end of the day rob yeah it has nothing to do with that i'll bet you this is good old school spying no, i i find it oh, really I difficult to believe after you go through all the layers of security you need to get through to 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 breach a a um, a production server, right? That's producing the builds. I'm willing to bet you someone got paid. That's what I think too. 
Right. Well, solar solar winds is famous to outsourcing to the very countries that we we are worried about spying on us um, from yeah. this perspective. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, to get to the build server, like having been the CTO of a, a security company, getting to our build server w would have required some inside access. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, the individuals holding those keys are in fact the, the weak link, the weakest links. They are the ones that are in many cases, the easiest to compromise, or let's put it this way. It's they're the easiest to find one who will, who's decided mm -hmm. that they are going to, you know, take the bribe, take the money. Um, yeah. It, it is, it, this is, this is espionage and, and it's espionage and, and, you know, it, it is a, you know, it's a fact of our lives and has been for a long time. Um, one of the things though, that you're kind of pointing to Rob, I think was the, it's kind of almost like a monoculture dependence on a few things that if they fail or if they if they fail to live up to the to the SLA hmm. in this case um, this um, endangers you know what uh, what we depend upon them for and that argues for alternate you know had you know, by policy, to making sure there are alternative means to supply things. There, you know, these mm -hmm. services, these fundamentals. It does, I think, demand to John's question um, some principles of policy that are that you know we apply or that the government applies in the creation of regulation. And, you know, I happen to be, have a kind of a personal uh, soft spot for kind of the, the radical transparency. You know, if you expose, if, if people have to be on record about what they say, what they do, how they've spent their money, um, they are, uh, less likely to take some of the actions that they are willing to take now uh, under the cloak of uh, anonymity. I strongly, strongly agree with that sentiment. I, I, have, I have two points on that that kind of tie John and Richard in together. So John talked about regulation, and, and what Richard kind of led me to is, is, is do we have is it time for us to start dealing with the the down or the bad effect of unfeathered capitalism? And here's where I'm going with this. So John talked about regulation as it relates to the financial crash. I go back to the testimony of Alan Greenspan. Okay, really? Um, I, go back, <laughs> I go back to Alan Greenspan in his testimony before Congress. And, and the one statement he said was, I did not think that business would act against its own best interests. In other words, business got greedy. Uh, I, thought you're going to your, I thought you were going to irrational exuberance. No, nah, I, 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 that's what I. That's where I thought you were going, Keith. Nah, that, that, so yeah, a little twist, right? I'm always about the economics. And then I go back to Richard when you talked about, you know, policy and things of that nature. I, 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 I go back to my earlier statement. I don't know if all of you were on when I said this. Is there come a point where? Companies are saying we are ill-equipped to deal with international espionage, country-on-country country spying, and there has to be help by a government entity to help companies deal with. If, if, if we're going to have this idea that because we are based on this, we are so afraid of socialism and other different government forms, I don't get me started on the ignorance and understanding of capitalism, socialism, <laughs> and, and, and communism. But I think everyone should go back to their history teacher and ask for their ask for their feedback. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, that if we're so afraid of these other forms of government or types of government, then there's got to 
and we're going to rely on enterprises to handle functions that really under other countries are handled by government entities, right? If we're going to give things like security, um, I mean, look at the military industrial complex and what they handle, you know, and what the secure R&D that they do. Yeah. If we're going to continue to do that, there has to be a place for government to protect these companies against government actors. They're just, I, I can't see you can't do it any other way. That, well, that is, yeah, that yeah, Keith is, yeah. is another form of, you know, the public good. No individual company is going to say, I'm going to spend a certain amount of my uh, revenues um, on defending the state of Texas or, you know, actually, that's probably more likely than, than most, but you know, that's Texas. Come and take it. Um, so but, the, the point being, it is done on behalf of the populace as a common good. That's why we have a U.S. military, not a bunch of individual state militias that are that are the, the basis on which we you know have military and, and other forms of defense. But I, I would argue that it, it's not <laughs> going to be the government, right? Who will it be? I, I, I think awesome. to some extent the, the, the private sector is actually better at solving this problem and bringing the transparency to it than the government is. That right. means that they would have and, to buy into it. But I'd go back. So I'll, I'll go like one really simplistic thing, right? The stock <laughs> app, right? Where, where, where the entire thing was you had senators trading off of inside information because it wasn't illegal. And they had it in congressional oh, hearings. Yeah. yeah. And then they put in the Stock Act to fix it. And six months later, it was too much work. So they basically took all the teeth out of it. And, and I've never met a broke senator. Right. <laughs> so that's right. If you don't trust it. So part of the problem with it is, is that, you know, not only will enterprises work in not in their best interest. Our government doesn't necessarily work in our best interest. Right. I, I, the, I don't think anybody's without, you know, without a uh, blame or without the need for a watchdog. I guess my question in this case is not, you know, overwhelming government regulation because I, I would, I would hate that. It was, it is, it's usually ill-informed, badly created, and basically causes more problems than, than, it's, than it's worth. The question would become, what is the basis? What is the, either the incentive or the, the ethical position that um, private sector adopts at, you know, this kind of broad, and with this kind of broad adoption, this broad embrace that would make this work from the private sector. I'm, yeah. I'm sure that they have the the kind of many of the technical and operational means of affecting some of this. The question is, can they make it as ubiquitous as it needs to be? Well, yeah, the interesting part about this and so flare is a, a interesting <laughs> example to drill down on, right? Mm -hmm. my, my first my first reaction, it, it ties edge, it ties all this shit together. My, my first reaction is I could have instrumented the code to detect those anomalies, right? And yep. then my second reaction is I remembered how much it generates and realized how unrealistic that was. <laughs> right? yep. um, and then I start thinking about, well, how would I go about solving this problem? I haven't come up with a good answer yet. Yeah. All right. Hey, hey, all right. <laughs> I love these conversations, and I hate to shut them down, but I actually need the bridge. Okay. So, okay. Hold on. Rob, before you, Rob, before you, before you get shot for doing that, let me, let me, let me, do, let me, let me tell the guys to do this. I, 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 I will challenge everyone to read, reread the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, Ooh. but do so, but do so making sure you read, they were supposed to be read together, read Theory of a Moral Sentiments. Theory of Moral Sentiments. They right. were supposed to be companion, companion books. They were never supposed to be 
that, that we were never supposed to do one without the other. And what we have in America is we have one without the moral sentiment. Just a post, thought. Post that in 2030. I would I would take that as our one. Once we get on the book train, if we can do that. Uh, let's discuss that. I love it. But I want to hear, I want to, I want, I want the links either way, because that sounds really fascinating. Gentlemen, ladies, this is mind blowing. Um, I love these conversations. Uh, I wish I could spend another hour on it, but today I can't. Yeah. All right. So, Have a great holiday, thank everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good holidays. Happy holidays.